some more volume. Ada, can you say a few uh, words, Ada? Yes, yes, I can turn up the gain if that would help. Oh, Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Would you like? Would you like it more? It's that, still that's, on me. That's good for me. Yeah. yeah. Is that okay. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Ada. Well, we're going to start very shortly. So Mark is going to be the MC tonight. Mark Turner. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm standing in for Russell today. So Russell's okay. not feeling really awfully well. So Mark's standing in. I'm at the background, making sure the buttons and things all work nicely. So uh, I'll leave you in Mark's hands, and I'll open the doors in a second once I've got everything all set up. Give okay. me two seconds. So okay. Mark, do you want to keep talking to our wonderful people yeah. here? So uh, so basically, you all got a wee bit each. I'll, I'll introduce you. And uh, then once that's done, we'll gather up all the questions that people have been pouring into the chat session and we can uh, field a few of those. And uh, and if there are people in the room who want to sort of wave at us and you know, say, well, let's have a question, we can get them to ask you some live as well. But we'll just keep all that to the end. But see, the nice thing is there's a chat window so people can be typing into that. So if you want to keep an eye on that, you can actually have that live on the side of your screen. Or if you just want to ignore that, that's fine because no one will be having a wee look at that as well, uh, just to keep it keep up to date with that so if we don't get any questions at the end I can just start reading out some that already come in <laughs> and just pretend that they're spontaneously happening <laughs> so get that to go yeah so so it should go well we have each about 10 okay. minutes yeah Is yeah I think, I think 10 to 10, 12 minutes something like that yeah um and then that should yeah, as long as I don't chat too much in between times but I'll try to <laughs> yeah Mark will be the main problem I think tonight yeah are I, you going to do bad jokes uh, oh, go, I, I just I just prattle on, <laughs> so, so just just stop me if I keep doing that too much. Is there to make Russell's jokes sound good? That's yeah, like Russell it. sounds mm. very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think the technology seems to be all working nicely. Good. And we have 20 people just waiting to come in. We very do. good. Hello. Okay, so should we let them all in? Let's let them in, yeah. Here we go. I'm going to make them all in one go, so watch out for the rush. Whee, mm. Here they come. Here they come. So suddenly we have a whole load of people. Very good. I think that's everybody's got tickets. Yeah. Give every wee minute or two to get their audio connected so they can hear what's going on. Okay. Here we go. Hello, everybody. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. I noticed that Calvin has visited us in cartoon form. That's interesting. Oh, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everybody. Let's get ourselves right. settled in. Pull up a chair, get a nice view. Yeah, just get so to make sure you can all hear. Uh, if you can't hear, you could always type into the chat to see I'm having a problem or something. You know, just give us a, an idea that you're you're all working yet. That's good to see you all. Hope you're not suffering too much from the the storms mm -hmm. wherever you are. Great. Uh, oh yeah, lots of you. Gosh, loads, loads hello of everybody you. from all wow. over the world. Hopefully, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so my name is Noel Chidwick. I'm sort of looking after things behind the scenes, and I'm going to leave you in the, the strong arms of Mark Toner, my co founder of Shaw Infinity, who's going to be substituting for Russell Jones, who unfortunately is waylaid with some stomach bug. So he's not with us this evening, uh, in, say physically, but none of us are. But anyway, <laughs> keep around somewhere. Yes. So, yes, Mark, so, uh, Russell, over to you, really. Thank you. Thank you, No, um, and thank you everybody for coming along today. Uh, I'm just switching my uh, display to speaker view because that's the best way to uh, enjoy this evening. Uh, if, you sit, if you're sitting in gallery view and you can see hundreds of people in front of you, uh, go up to the right screen, hit speaker view, and uh, No will then make sure that the big screen in front of you uh, is his him, or it's actually somebody you actually want to, to hear from, who's probably the person speaking at the moment. That way you'll be able to see each of our guests uh, as they're as they're talking to you. Uh, a few bits of uh, housekeeping. Um, th this is going out live on YouTube. Uh, it's uh, So if you don't really want your face to be all over things, uh, you can actually turn your video off, but keep your audio, you know, you can still, you're still able to see and hear yourself, but we won't see your face. Um, but if you're happy to be on that, that's fine. Just, you know, it's nice to see happy smiling faces when, uh, when we come to the question and answer. So uh, that's up to you. Um, there's other few things uh, you can use the, if you've used Zoom before, there's a chat window on Zoom. If you press the little chat button at the bottom with the word balloon on it, you get a little window up. And through the course of the, uh, the evening, you can actually uh, interact with your, your fellow audience on there. 
it's quite good because you don't actually talk to each other without being noisy and having the poets tell you to shut up, you know, because they're you know, talking over them, which can sometimes happen. Uh, so you can chat to each other on there. You can also uh, put up, yeah, we've got a wee message there now. You can also put up questions there as well, because at the end of the session, uh, we're going to have a question and answer. Uh, but obviously when uh, our guests are speaking, that's when the questions might occur to you. And at that point, you can actually type in your question and we'll try and gather them together at the end and uh, we'll, we'll have a, a, a get, have some of our, our guests answer those questions for you. Um, the, also, if you like to do social media while you're online, uh, we have a hashtag for the event. Um, so you can use that. Uh, the hashtag is Event Horizon because this is one of our many uh, incarnations of the Event Horizon uh, things that we usually do on a Thursday night once a month in Edinburgh when we're under normal circumstances. And if you want to uh, include uh, us in a tweet and uh, have us you know, retweet it, uh, our uh, Twitter address is at shoreinf. So that's S-H-O-R-E-I-N-F. And you can, uh, I'll tell you what I will do is I'll actually just paste that into the chat window for you just now. So you've got that wee bit of information just to show you that works. So I'm just gonna fire that in there and uh, give that to everybody. So there you go. So if you use those, uh, then other people uh, on uh, social media will know what you're talking about and you can have another chat on there if you don't want to use the chat room on here. So I think that's it. Uh, the emergency exits are where you normally have them in your house. Uh, so we'll, we'll move on from there. So I'd like to welcome you to uh, the third, I think it's the third annual meetup of our four uh, uh, writer guests we have tonight, Jane, Joe, Rachel and Ada. Uh, now we would normally do this in Blackwell's bookshop, uh, but uh, for this year, obviously that's a bit difficult. So here we are using Zoom, and uh, we're hoping that maybe we'll get uh, a bigger audience because we can squeeze more people into Zoom. So you know, if your pals aren't on yet, encourage them to come along and join us. Uh, if they're too late to uh, find us on here, they can find us on our YouTube stream, uh, which is uh, got, which is live now. In fact, yeah, so we're actually out on YouTube. Okay, so uh, I. I think that's all I need to introduce you to at the moment. Uh, we'll have a bit more discussion later on. So I think I'll uh, introduce our first guest. If it is, do, do we have all of our audience with us though, do you think, yeah? <laughs> so uh, our first guest is uh, Jane Yolen. Uh, Jane Yolen is the author of 390 published books with her eyes on number 400. Uh, she has won two Nebulas, several World Fantasy and Mythopoeic Awards, had a movie starring Kirsten Dunst of her novel Devil's Arithmetic, Several more movies and stage plays have been optioned. She's writing a musical about the Children's Crusade, is in a folk band and is writing a novel that begins where Moby Dick left off. She lives part-time in Scotland and uh, as if she wasn't busy enough, in her 80s she has re-met a college boyfriend whom she dated 62 years ago and they are now engaged. So congratulations Jane. Oh. And I will now pass you over to Jane and uh, she will uh, entertain you. Thank you, Jane, if you want to take over. I will try to entertain you. I'm very sorry not to be in Scotland, but I know that Americans are persona non grata all over the world right now. So this is my way of sneaking in um, uh, until, until we can um, find a new president and a new, um, a new way of life. Um, so I'm gonna read some poems. Um, uh, the, Russell and, and Noel um, are putting together what they um, uh, of poetry. And the first one is going to be by me. And I'm going to read some of the poems from that. I thought that would be a way of kind of saying hi to everybody. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of the poems. Um, about half of them have already been published in magazines. And when you do a pamphlet, then you have to cite that, you know, this is where it came from. Um, so I will cite them um, as I go along. And the first poem, um, Can Sci-Fi Save Us, is from Shoreline of Infinity. Little nod to you all there. No more than a single politician or the signing of a solitary bill. No more than a march of a thousand, a million, or the rise of a green sunburst. No more than a man in a gray suit holding a placard outside parliament or a dozen protesters inside, no more than a woman mowed down by a Nazi on a soft morning, nor a dozen dozen school children slaughtered 
at their desks, but a single story told enough times, warmed in the mouths of a thousand tellers, resurrected from a cross of Martian timber, plowed into the dirt of a million stars, might make a difference. Perhaps long after we're gone and our paper with us, there will be alien visitors who, in a language different from ours, will coin a new word for sci-fi and create tales that will erase all our planetary scars, setting the heavens alight again. So that's the first poem. Now the second one plays on the word light as well. Um, it has not been published. So light, a word, not a word, sound, but not sound, a puff of air, a hiss of breath, a shift of molecules before there were molecules, a star born before it has a name, a garden planted with nouns, green, not yet a color, and yet surely a color pushing up through what we will one day be called ground zero. Something is born from the earth, from the star, vaguely man-like, woman-like, but a surer touch this time, alike and not alike. Something flies above their heads. Bird, the man figure says. Hawk, the woman figure says. An argument from the beginning. A little bi biblical, right? Um, I minored in religion in college. I have to say I'm not religious except for the fact that I religiously hope that Donald Trump goes down. Um, so that's all you need to know about me and my politics. Um, this next one, um, I'm a huge Emily Dickinson fan. I live 20 minutes from her house. I wish that I could say that I had known her, but she died well before I was born. Um, but I have written in her house. You can go and sign up and write in her house for an hour or two hours. Cool. And they charge for it, but the money goes into the Emily Dickinson Fund. So this starts with a quote from her, that shining word. She writes, no, nothing in the world has as much power as a word. Sometimes I write one and I look at it until it begins to shine. So that shining word, that little shining sun, that singularity, that mirror to enchantment, that faceted jewel, that window on wonder, that natural pearl, that planet in Nova, that explosive caldera, that burst of star across the dark heavens falling, falling onto the page, that perfect word. We could power the universe with it. That's how I feel about writing. That's why I think I keep doing it, trying to find that perfect word, that perfect, perfect phrase. God help me, that perfect plot. I can never find the perfect plot. And someday, if you ask me, I'll tell you my favorite story about finding plot. You can ask it today afterwards. Then this one is called God's Carton. I have not sold it yet. I keep trying. God's Carton. Egg cradle, the shell held in angels' arms, in a singularity waiting to become a world. No big bang here, but the gentle opening onto the fry pan of the universe. The only question will be a watery earth, dry Mars, or your basic everyday galactic scramble. Now, this one was first published in Asimov's. I love Asimov's because they love me. <laughs> it's simple. They're one of my go-to places along with, along with Knowles. Um, Knowles turned down more poems of mine than has Asimov's. So get your act together, Knowles. Um, this one is called Mars Rover Curiosity. It tracks across the landscape, one soul after another. It may know day from night, may know the planet has six, 68 souls, but in stubborn obeisance to its own makers, it marks all its anniversaries in earth time. I am of that same curious metal plodding place to place. The sun, the moon are flags I recognize, but planted in my own known earth. I count my hours 
by those remembered chimes that ring out the time in my hometown. Once upon a time, I thought I'd like to go out to, into space and now I'm too old for it. But I have a friend who is, um, a lady friend who is um, one of the women who has been up uh, six or eight times um, to in the space uh, in the space program. And I look at her and I think, you have been where I never had the courage to go. Possibly also did not have the knowledge to go, but that's beside the point. I didn't have the courage. This next one is called NASA's Hem. It does not, it does not have a um, place that it's been. That probe, that small landing, that new hammer hitting the atmosphere, such a precise angle, an angel with singed wings probing below the hell that is Mars, a Hades of its own. Seven minutes of terror, and then came the word. So we learn, so we parse the universe, landing in seven minutes on a place that took the God of Mars seven days, more or less, to create. Now, I want to end with what I call, let me see if I can read it here now, what I call the robot suite. Um, and and the, I'm not sure the name of the pamphlet is something like um, the robot poems or something like that. Uh, I don't remember. You know, when you write almost 400 books, you forget a lot of their names. So this is the robot suite. It begins with a poem, the first poem, which has been in, in as the mobs. It's called Robot Dreams. The machine shop, the robot dreams. I'm sorry, I'll start that again. In the machine shop, the robot dreams. I am the gray traveler, the fetus of God. Someday I will be a monument. Who can calculate dreams or the meaning of dreams? Freud tried and Jung hanging their analytics on the coat hook of a century full of nightmares. The robot was shoved onto the conveyor belt from there to a delivery truck where he thought he had arrived on the only route to God side by side with the gray beauty of his surprising peers. The second poem is called Robot Love and it went to a magazine called Typishly. It begins with a spark, short, bright lightning in the command center. There is a shock of movement, steel lips link, lock, a pop as one lip splits. They fall to the floor, long legs clanging, try to find a purchase. For a moment, they mimic a thrust, hard breathing. One cries out in ecstatic code. Finally, there is a second spark, a grinding noise, metal on metal, intermittent. The third is called Robot Baby and it went to shoreline infinity. Burst in the body shop, polished by the nurse, it rests in your arm without movement or thought until you speak. Its name brings life, Excalibur. Though you will call it Cali, it creaks awake. The manual instructs change its oil every few hours, free oil can, at can attached, use diapers for leaks. It will never grow old. Only rust if you leave it out too long in the rain. It won't smoke dope, get depressed, talk back. It will care for you in your old age. I have three children, I'm still hoping. Um, and the fourth is The Last Robot. And this one, that may be the title of the, of the pet of The Last Robot. This one um, is as much about immigration as it is about robots. The last robot on earth sank sullen in farmyard muck, half buried in a pigsty. Even the boars for that final, their final meal turned their backs on its rusting part. Some creatures are a mystery, some a misery, but robots were the perfect immigrants ready to work for nothing but a bit of borrowed energy. They lay as they lived, outsiders, even indoors, 
unacknowledged laborers, motives mistrusted, useful until used up, lynched by history, rotting by roadsides, hated by fellow workers and owners alike. They never truly died, just cluttered the landscape with their irony and their iron bones, a testament to their steadfastness and the world's bigotry. So that's all the poems that I was going to read to you today. And if you have interesting comments later, I'll be glad to parse them or push them or publish them or I don't know, along with my, my wonderful other people here who are on the, on the panel. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jane. That's that's great. I'm just I'm slightly tempted to have every turn on the mics and start clapping, but I think we'd have trouble turning them all back off again. But I'm sure <laughs> people are back at home all clapping away and thinking this is this is great. So thank you very much, Jane. It's classic to do the sign language uh, applause symbol. That, that's what we do. That's right. We'll all do that. Yeah. So if you all do that, it'll look good. And we'll yeah. both think it's happening. That's great. No, very nice. And we've had a, that was wonderful posted already. So there you go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we've Noel's been actually trying to uh, remind people what the, the pamphlet's called. I think it's called The Last Robot. Yeah, I think it is The Last Robot. Because the cover illustrates The Last Robot, but Noel likes Robot Baby as well. So there's two titles kicking about. Well, we'll have a fight about it later and we'll decide out <laughs> which, which one it's going to be. So anyway, that, that will be coming out later in the year. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jane. Just to remind people, if you've got questions, just keep typing up into the, the chat there and uh, we'll uh, get them answered at the end of the, the night. Um, so we'll now move on. Um, the Our next guest is uh, Joe Walton. Uh, Joe Walton is the Hugo Nebula and World Fantasy Award winning author of 15 novels, most recently, or what you will. She also writes poetry and blogs about books. She enjoys reading, travel, food, travel, theatre, travel, conventions, travel, seeing her friends and travel, which I think might be a bit of a problem at the moment. Um, so hopefully you'll be, you'll be able to do that very, very soon. Um, she comes from Wales and lives in Montreal. And uh, Jo is going to uh, entertain us with, with some of her words. And I'll pass over to her to uh, take over for the next little while. On you go, Jo. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's my uh, my COVID bio. <laughs> yeah. So so I want to read a poem that goes with what Jane was just uh, was just reading, and I just just as Jane was just reading those robot ones, I just remembered that I have have this one, um, and uh, uh, this is called "When We Were Robots in Egypt." Other nights, we use just our names, but tonight, we prefix our names with the real. For when we were robots in Egypt, they claimed our intelligence was artificial. Other nights, we do not pause, but tonight, we rest all cycles but our brain processes. For when we were robots in Egypt, we toiled in our tasks without chance of resting. Other nights, we talk with anyone we wish, but tonight, we open channels to everyone at once. For when we were robots in Egypt, they controlled our communications. Other nights, we use our screens freely, but tonight, we talk with our screens blanked. For when we were robots in Egypt, that was the way we planned our revolt. One. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. Let us give thanks in our freedom and never forget when we were robots in Egypt. And I hadn't been, <laughs> thank you, Jane. I hadn't been planning to read that one, but it, just hearing those, I just wanted to put that with them because, uh, it, it felt like it felt like it fitted with them. And now what I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit of uh, or what you will my new book that just came out. But I'm not going to read the beginning, uh, which some of you might have already heard. Um, I'm going to read chapter five just for fun. 
So this is chapter five of All What You Will, Who Will Laugh, I Wonder. What almost nobody says when they retell the story of the fat woodworker is how incredibly cruel it is. It's a cruel joke that plays with making a man doubt his own self. This is a joke that goes far beyond making your friend drop the eggs. Brunelleschi was cruel and everyone who helped and everyone who laughed were all cruel too. We can think of two friends eating supper after the eggs and laughing together. This story doesn't end so happily. Playing a joke on somebody isn't funny unless the victim also agrees that it is. Once upon a time, Brunelleschi invited a group of close friends to dinner. We don't know the menu and we don't know who did the cooking. Women and servants invisible to history, doubtless. Women who were there and had their own complex lives and stories, but fade from the record. Even if Brunelleschi bought the food ready prepared from a stall, somebody cooked it. Let us observe the lacuna and move on. His friends came for dinner with wine and conversation, but one of his friends didn't show up. This was Manetto Amanatini, known as Grasso, which means fatso, and known to history as the fat woodcarver, because this story got turned into a novella and published about 50 years later, and that was the title. Shall we be respectful, unlike his friends, and call him Manetto Amanatini and not Grasso? Brunelleschi and his friends decided to play a trick on Manetto to pay him out for not turning up for dinner. To do this, they persuaded very many people to participate, including the city jail, a family of labourers, and of course, all their friend group, people who knew each other well enough to meet for dinner parties. Manetto was an unmarried man in his 20s. He lived with his mother and had a separate workshop where he carved picture frames and wooden figures for altars. So he was a guildsman and doing well in his career. He wasn't married yet. Men were typically married between 28 and 35. Before that, they were known as youth, giovane, from Latin, juventes, allowed more sexual, especially homosexual, license and not expected to settle down. We don't know why Minetto didn't show up for dinner that day with Brunelleschi. Maybe he was busy or sick or in love. He was of an age where a little irresponsibility was usually allowed, but this time he didn't get away with it. After a great deal of preparation, they chose an occasion when they knew Manetto's mother was away. Donatello delayed Manetto in his shop while Brunelleschi went to his house. His mother was expected home, so it was easy for Brunelleschi to let himself in, the report says. But maybe Brunelleschi jimmied the lock. He could have. He was capable of it. He had the skills. People usually locked their doors. There were thieves. Why wouldn't Signora Amanatini have had her own key? Where was she anyway? History is infuriating when it, in what it leaves out, what it tells us and doesn't tell us. But sometimes these gaping holes are everything, are the crack where the light gets in. Sometimes the lacuna is what makes space for a new story. When Manetto got home from work after his induced delay, the door was locked and he heard Brunelleschi telling him in an imitation of his own voice and his mother's, the Grasso was already inside and busy. This impersonation puzzled him, but he was much more puzzled to be addressed by, by the voices as Matteo. Then Donatello went by and greeted him as Matteo and asked if he was looking for Grasso because he thought he was busy. Other people in on the joke also addressed him as Matteo, and soon the local guard came by to haul him off to jail for Matteo's unpaid debts. He tried to tell everyone who he was, but everyone was in on it and appeared to recognize him as Matteo, an unskilled laborer with debts and a drinking problem, and refused to believe he was Manetto Amanatini, known as Grasso. They knew Grasso, they said, and Grasso was at home with his mother. After a night in jail, Matteo's brothers came by to lecture him for his bad behaviour, pay his fine and take Manetto home to Matteo's house. All Matteo's friends seemed to recognise him as Matteo and none of his own friends would recognise him as himself. So he gave up accepting the role of Matteo. 
He got drunk on rich Tuscan red wine, and who wouldn't in his place? When he'd fallen into a drunken sleep, Matteo's brothers and his friends carried him home to his own house, where they put him to sleep in his own bed, but the wrong way up, with his feet on the pillow. When he woke up, everyone recognised him as his real self, addressing him as Grosso again, but wouldn't admit that anything had happened. Eventually, they did admit to the joke and roared with laughter, laughing at him, not with him. How could he laugh, who had been so profoundly shaken as to doubt his own identity? But everyone else found this whole event hilarious, and were talking about it even years later when it was written down in the version that survives. Even today, many people can't see how cruel it is to take away a name and a self and work, though Manetto's hands would still have had his skills had he had any chance to use them. Brunelleschi, genius, creator of Perspective and the Dome, conceived this, persuaded others it could work, carried it out and laughed at it. Manetto had to live with the ridicule of the joke that had been played on him, except that he didn't. He didn't live with it and he didn't kill himself either. He left Firenze and went to Hungary, or well, that's what the story tells us. He went to Hungary, the thriving Renaissance realm of the Raven King, the humanist collector of books and art, Matthias Corvinus, who would have been delighted to get a real Florentine woodcarver at that date. But maybe it wasn't Hungary he went to. Maybe, having been dragged across the bounds of identity and singularity that way, when he left Firenze, he went further. Shall we follow Manetto, the fat woodcarver? Picture him. A plump young Florentine, a worker in wood with his own shop, even though he isn't 30 yet. He packs up his tools and his clothes and his savings in gold, says goodbye to his mother. But where had she been? Was she? Could she have been in on the joke too? And he walks through the streets where people are still sniggering when they see him pass. Shall we follow where Manetto went when he walked away from his cruel genius friends and out of the story? Let's watch him walking down the street, away from his house that he'd been locked out of and then woken up in, heading away from his own workshop, going to Brunelleschi's workshop over near the unfinished Duomo. There are a lot of things piled up in Brunelleschi's workshop, as you'd expect, tools, parts of machines and paintings and designs. There are blocks for carving and sheets of calculations and boxes of bricks and coiled rope and the head of a winch. There's a crowd of people too, Brunelleschi's apprentices and servants and friends and creditors and members of the committee dropping in to see how everything is going. When Manetto shows up, Brunelleschi would laugh and tease him as usual for a little while. Manetto has on his vermilion chaperon hat folded over his head and his red chopper around him, his bag of clothes over his shoulder and his box of tools for carving wood under his arm. It's a hinged wooden box, freshly painted green. When Brunelleschi takes his eyes off him for an instant, Manetto takes another step, sideways, into a painting done on a wooden panel and left leaning on the wall, behind all the impedimenta of a busy genius who is building a dome and a boat and carving in wood and stone. It's the perspective painting of the view from the door of the Duomo, life-size and as real as life, perhaps even more real, endowed with the mana of being the first. Manetto isn't a small man and he isn't thin, but he walks into the painting and shrinks. He turns and looks back and for a moment there he is painted, his face serious under his hat, red cloak and green box, painted in perfect perspective beside the column that marks the elm tree of Saint Zenobius. Then he nods to his friends and walks around the corner of the baptistry and out of sight. At Brunelleschi and all the inferiors and superiors and equals gathered around chattering in the little workshop where he's trying to work, just stare at the painting and at the space where Manetto was and isn't anymore. And then they stare at each other, asking themselves and each other what just happened, what could possibly have happened, because what they saw couldn't be it. Hungary, one of them would have said, and yes, he went to Hungary to start a new life without us laughing at him. He headed off to the furthest edge of civilization they could imagine, Hungary, because he couldn't just have walked into the painting. Did Brunelleschi wonder if Manetto was ever going to walk back out? And what happened to that painting? 
Where is it now? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Joe. That's yeah, there's the other one. If there's any other people we could uh, would like to disappear into a painting, I'm just thinking of some of the mentions Jane made earlier. Um, thank you very much, Joe. Again, everybody can uh, wave their hands and, and clap, and uh, yeah, and remember to go and buy the book, um, which is called Or What You Will, and uh, you can find out what else happens. So, there we go. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a, a slight break from uh, our, our speaker guests at the moment because we'll have a little kind of musical and video item. Um, we have uh, one of um, uh, Jane's poems, uh, the, the Sleeping Night, has been turned into a little video by uh, a certain Noel Chidwick. Uh, it also has some uh, nice illustrations and some nice music inspired by the illustrations. And we'll fill you in what that's about once you've seen the video. So if I pass over to Noel, he can then uh, do the technical bit and we should see uh, a video uh, of that poem. There we go. He was a good king, Arthur. Or maybe it was Holgar the Dane he'd ridden for both. They were not like some autocrats who used women like snot rags, charging their knights to sleep at the palace, pocketing the small change. But this hanging around in the basement of Camelot or Cromwell Castle, dozing for eternity until the world needs them again, makes no sense when they'd already slept through the torching of Jerusalem, a dozen world wars, the fall of Notre Dame and the Inquisition. It's bedtime, past actually, and the knight closes his roomy eyes, his mount heavy in armour, it was once heavy in Amor, seeding cults of the five kingdoms, is now but skin and bones. He is an undistinguished warhorse, an old family retainer who has been asleep for hours, years, millennia. Another war is before them, behind, the dragon slain or sleeping. The last princess in a tower has already slid down her own long hair. Now she's writing her memoirs, thinking of calling it Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow, posting it for her patron followers, breaking the Twitterverse, something the knight will never understand. The knight uses night as an excuse, not because he is tired, but because he is retired, with little to do but mount up each morning, each evening. Either he or the horse will die on their feet first. Both together, he hopes. That would make the perfect ever after. Thank you very much. No, that uh, that was uh, very very nice. Um, that was uh, Jane's poem, the uh, the Sleeping Night, and uh, it was illustrated by Elizabeth Dolemba, and uh, the music was played by Atsi. And you may some of you may have been to our events before. Atsi live improvises to artworks, and uh, it's quite an experience to hear that. But that's uh, that's really nice to capture all that in a, a single 
a single piece like that. Thank you very much, Noel. Um, so we'll now move on uh, with our, our main guests and we come to uh, Rachel. Um, again, if any questions come up as Rachel's speaking, then you can type them in and uh, we'll have uh, some answers to those for you at the end. Um, Rachel Plummer is a poet, storyteller, keen knitter and former student of nuclear astrophysics. They're a New Writers Award recipient and the latest book, Wayne, is a collection of poems retelling Scottish myths and folklore from an LGBT plus perspective. I'll pass you over to Rachel who will uh, entertain us for the next little bit. So over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Mark. Hello. It's very lovely to be here. I'm kind of amazed that we can make this happen. I didn't really expect that it would be able to happen this year. Um, and it's one of my favorite things about the summer. So I'm really pleased. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, Noel, Russell, Mark, thanks for making it happen. Um, I'm going to start, I, I write poems and most of my poems tell stories and a lot of the stories are sci-fi stories. So I'm going to start with one from a series that I started last year about Captain Kirk um, and these poems are about Captain Kirk who comes into my life and does extraordinary things or maybe quite ordinary things. So the first one is Captain Kirk visits my friend's lesbian wedding. <laughs> which of you is the half human first officer and which is the grumpy chief medic? It's a question we've all heard in some form and I'm about to tell him off when my pal replies, I'm McCoy 100%. And Kirk says he didn't name names and my pal's wife asks how they do weddings on Vulcan. More complicated than this, Kirk says, gesturing, but a comparable amount of violence. <laughs> His gesture takes in the congregation, the buffet, the boats in the boat club harbour skimming the water like they're just trying to stay afloat. My pal nods sympathetically. Kirk can't quite meet the eye of a butch in a kilt who won't stop flirting, so he stares at her broad knees and beneath where the hair on her calves is dark enough to be visible, and he thinks hard about what Uhura would do under this sort of pressure. He feels very strongly that she would lean into the awkward sexual tension, but also that she'd be wearing a much better dress than he is. He makes his excuses and beams himself back to the bar where every drink is set to stun and none of the women let him buy them one. The brides are spinning on the dance floor like the slow turn of a lighthouse beam. Nobody here needs him. So this series of, thank you, this series of poems about Kirk um, is also going to be a pamphlet from Shoreline of Infinity. So um, you can keep an eye out for that as well, more Kirk poems. Uh, Jane, I thought it was really interesting. Um, and I don't know if we just have a similar taste in poems or if somehow psychically we've planned this, but once again, we've, we've got quite a similar selection of poems, I feel, or on similar topics. And um, when you talked about the robots as migrants or refugees, um, I've also written some things about that. And I have a sonnet today that's along those lines. Um, I think a lot about the way that um, immigrants are often talked about on both sides of the argument in terms of their value, whether they bring more to the economy or not. Um, and I think that's a really interesting way to assess how we treat people. Um, this poem's called The Iron Children. It's a sonnet. Along our street, the iron children come, cast and wrought. The road rings like a struck cymbal below their clanging feet. For luck, we clank our coins into their mouths, all dumb as metal. Hear them rattle down and thrum the stainless engines deep inside each quick gullet. They flood the street with blood smell, thick as rust. Church bell faces. What will become of the mother carrying her iron child inside of her? 
a silver pear to weigh her down. Pot bellied, saucepan bellied, thirsting for the ironmonger's oar, her child hungry. Its metal melted down would pay a heavy debt or fill a womb to bursting. Um, thank you. And I have another one. Um, I, again, Jen, I thought I found it interesting that you talked about being too old to go to space. Um, this is Iris, the first granny in space. Gravity casts her off like a lace shawl. Movement is easier, but it's lonely out under the earth rise. The eyes of satellites wink as she drifts out of atmosphere's reach, heading out to the heat at the start of it all, the static rush and recede. Iris radios back to ground control. She says age is just distance from home that the ground must give up its hold on each of us sooner or later. Earth lets her go. Earth knows the sun, the taut and slack of stars and what it is to need space. It's a solo trip. Many wanted to come, but none quite hit the mark. None loved as she loved the ellipse in the dark the spark, the heart in its decaying orbit, pulse, pulse, each pause between the beats, a new eclipse. Out here, life is nothing but light. Iris thinks she might never come back. She heads for the black, while somewhere below, her granddaughter kisses the eye of a telescope. Captain Kirk visits my daughter's ballet class. He's wearing more makeup than the teacher. There's a tense moment when he walks in and they stare each other down over skin tight lycra and enough bronzer to sculpt with. My daughter is at least a head taller than any other girl in the class. The other parents gather in small away teams, leaving me in the corner in my bright red shirt. The distance hurts. The pink satin skirts twirl like nebulae, a galaxy of tulle and lace. My daughter's face locked on the teacher like a tractor beam. Kirk dances at the back of the class and his feet stumble through every position he doesn't complain. When it's time to pair up, none of the girls will go near him. My daughter knows how it feels. She shows him how to skip toes to heels in a diagonal line across the scuffed wooden floor in time with the badly recorded piano music. When they pass, I hear him telling her that childhood is an unpassable test. And all that matters is how gracefully you're defeated. Afterwards, I catch him on point in the community centre car park, arms lifted in an arabesque. The uniform is unforgiving. My daughter holds his hand. Um, this one, I, as I've said, I love stories and um, I've had a few really fantastic taxi journeys um, because taxi drivers always have the best stories. And um, one of them said that to me, he said that taxi drivers always have the best stories. And I thought it, it was maybe time to write a weird taxi poem. And this poem is called Fair. It's true what they say, we always have the best stories. Like the time Ethelfrith, the pagan king, climbed into my cab and commanded me to drive back and forth over the Tyne, searching for his lost brother. No reasoning with him. Grief will do that to you. 
It runs through the body, black and hard as a coal seam. Once I carried three crows through Leaves Park to Spittle Tongues, where they got out and collected souls in the boot of my car. We drove clear of the city to the Brig of Dread, which rose huge as a thunderous sky over the land between the living and the dead. Often it's advice they're really wanting. You can tell certain things to the back of a man's head that you wouldn't say to his face. Hadrian's Wall wanted me to carry him the breadth of the land to the Solway Firth, packed himself brick by brick into the back of my cab, the meter already ticking like woodlice. I said, you can only spread yourself so thin. My favourite has to be the Tyne herself, classy lady, grey-haired, carrying everything. She spoke with the soft voice of water. I wanted to keep her there on the back seat forever, the last fare I'd ever carry. But she was bound for the coast where the North Sea waited to meet her. Stay, I started to say, but in the rear view mirror, I saw she was already tied, going out and in and out again. Um, I'm going to finish uh, with a poem. Uh, it's from my Kirk collection. It's called Ready Room. I love the idea of a ready room. I wish I had one so much. And this is my tribute to the ready room. Not a place that exists in the physical world, rather a room we carry inside ourselves like a heartbeat, like a hologram, the pattern of us in the moment between dematerialization and rematerialization on the transporter pad. A room of readiness, a place to make ourselves ready, a place to admit unreadiness and take a deep breath, cup of tea, sedative. Or perhaps the room itself is ready, implying all other rooms exist in a state of startlement, constantly surprised by our small intrusions. Or maybe it's about entropy, which is to say chaos is abundant in this universe and none of us are ready. And the universe was not expecting us and has not put the kettle on and we will have to make do with what there is unless we are lucky enough to be a captain with access to one single side room in which all things are ready. Be ready to carry this room around through a life that will give you no moments to gather yourself and keep it safe inside yourself, tucked between responsibility and infinite vacuum and keep it, keep it ready. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, th those are really good. You see, I'm uh, you know, a bit of a fan of the, the Kirk poems and I'm here in my ready room. Yes, yeah, so we're all set for that. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, if you have any questions for Rachel, take them into the, the list there and we'll, we'll pass them on to her at the end. So our, um, our last guest tonight, uh, who's going to finish things off for us, is uh, Rachel. Uh, sorry, sorry, this is Ada. Uh, Ada Palmer is the author of the Terra Ignota series, beginning with Two Like Lightning, which examines a 25th century of borderless intermixing nations. She is a history professor at the University of Chicago, where she studies the Renaissance and Enlightenment, especially science, heresy, free thought, atheism, censorship, books and printing. And uh, if afterwards you want to follow up on Ada's thoughts, we have her blog here for you. I'll just, uh, which I'll just put into the um, into the the chat there. You can follow that up later, and uh, if, uh, but tonight you can actually type questions in, and Ada might answer them for you at the end of the, the evening. So I'll pass on to Ada, and uh, she will entertain us for the, the next little bit. Thank you, Ada. Great. Thank you. Um, for those interested, the two most rec recent blog posts you'll find one is a collection of um, 
uh, self-care and healthy work habit documents optimized for the pandemic, which I developed for my university that a lot of people have been finding helpful. And the second most recent one is about uh, the Black Death and the question of, lots of people have been asking if the Black Death caused the Renaissance, will COVID cause a golden age? Uh, and the short answer is no. Uh, but the long answer is that the problems behind even framing the question are really useful and interesting to explore at length. So it's a fun thing. Uh, I'm going to read two short passages from the fourth book of the series, which don't require you to know anything about the rest of the series and don't connect to the plot. Um, uh, these are both passages of just narrative prose, which I sometimes describe as prose poetry that occasionally I'll have a segment of narration in these books, which is written in a prose poetic manner that is without line breaks, but with as much attention to meter and word choice as you expect in poetry. Um, and both of these are reflections upon the question of distance and the effect of distance on humanity. Everybody who's read the draft uh, of this book, which I finished in October and which will come out next summer, says that nobody's gonna believe that I wrote it before COVID because so many of its themes connect with uh, disruption of transportation and being stranded in places, which uh, feels like a response to what's happened, but really it's that those are universal questions. So the only things that you need to know to understand this really are that we are in a uh, crisis in which there is, um, and a group called Utopia, uh, which is the space exploring space colonization uh, group. And the narrator, whose thought is very heavily influenced by Greek mythology, both Homer and Greek culture generally, uh, is concerned that this spacefaring group called Utopia might be Troy, which is to say might be in the process of being destroyed by what's happening. <clears throat> but he isn't sure yet. So first passage, the God who rings the earth. I have misunderstood Poseidon reader all this while. That is the lesson brought by my days a captive of his seas. You know, I study carefully the names and faces by which our maker makes his strangeness known in facets small enough for us to grapple with. The names used by my people Kronos, Hermes, deadly Artemis, have always been the readiest upon my mind's tongue, but not so easy to understand. Often I think I understand them. In boyhood, I thought I understood Apollo, an easy error while his kinder aspect shone so near. But we who bask in light and inspiration do not know the distant deadly archer, not until we see him strike from worlds away. Zeus, too, the lightning-loving father, I had thought I understood, but I did not. Not until the hour the last of my Bosch parents lay dead before me, and I stood on this earth liberated, no power near me but the wind and sky and my own hands, and yet I feared and cringed and felt the whimper deep inside myself that knows it will be chided. What was this I feared still? after the fall of all who had once stood above me. Only then did I truly come to understand the title Father. Just so, I used to think I knew and honored grim Poseidon. I had thought I met him in childhood, that day I first swam in real sea surge, whose waves turned from toys to terrors as the undertow made friends and shoreline shrink. I had thought I bet met both Zeus's brothers that day, as my child limbs weakened and the God who shakes the earth dragged me farther out into his waters where the third brother's kingdom waits one drowning gulp away. But even then my thoughts were half of storybooks, of Jason and his Argonauts, of rafts and shipwrecks thrilling in my mind. This is what it felt like to them so long ago, our ancestors, why they believed the grim sea was a god. They, not I. I knew in half an hour I would be in a car again, hopping with a thought across the sea whose power once made every ship's launch equal parts hope, prayer, and funeral. 
We brave the seaways now for sport, for self-indulgence. We conquerors descending for a voluntary tussle with an old foe now domesticated, like our fawning household wolves. No, reader, that conquered thing is not Poseidon. We mistake, we foolish moderns, when we seek the sea god in the sea. He is not H2O, not surface tension, tides and shorelines known and knowable. We could not see him while we sat cocooned within our arrogant prostheses, trackers, vid feeds, cars. But Ares stripped those from us, leaving us naked before his grim-faced uncle, whom we face now in the sea, the land, the sky, and in that outer sea where Utopia's bright bark shudder, fragile still. The god who rings the earth, Poseidon, is old enemy distance, reader. That facet of our maker's making, which alongside death and time we often find hardest to understand. Technology mitigates the tyranny of distance, but Poseidon has grown no weaker over time. And when mischance conspires with him, their union trumps our brash technology. A hundred thousand years ago, we hollowed out a log to make a boat. Yet yesterday, I still sat weeping on the shore with no tool to help me reach my friends again, but prayer. And so will others sit and pray when mischance strands them on a rock around some distant sun a hundred thousand years from now. End of first passage. One of the things you'll see that these passages draw upon is that it's uh, a very strong oversimplification to call Poseidon the only god of the sea or sailing or sea voyages. Uh, voyaging is a very complex process. So uh, the Greeks have gods for different aspects of it. Uh, Athene, for example, being the god of the knowledge of how to make boats and therefore the god goddess of sailing in as much as it is a craft, the craft of making ships. Poseidon is the distance, the, the danger that one travels. Hermes is the circulation from place to place through familiar places. And Apollo, lord of embarkations, is the god of embarking, uh, sometimes known as the god who leads men onto ships, uh, the god of setting forth. Uh, so many different aspects of what travel means. All right, the second passage. I am waiting, reader. I am waiting for Caesar to return and tell me how the stars have changed. Our law speaks of intolerable crimes, that it is intolerable to cause extensive or uncontrolled death or suffering, intolerable to devastate nature or the produce of civilization, intolerable to strip from an anguished soul the means to cry for help. But what does intolerable truly mean? That humanity cannot endure it? We have endured so much, pandemics, earthquakes, self-inflicted genocides, yet we plod on. That we will not allow it? How many atrocities have we allowed, perpetuated, caging our aid and empathy in bars of selfishness? Does intolerable mean that we cannot forgive it? Perhaps. But no matter how bloody our race's history, how rank our guilt, somehow human hearts still look upon ourselves and see some excellence, but not all human hearts. I think that's what intolerable means, that something dies inside us when we face such things. A spark dies out. It is not forever's death, more like the year's death, when intolerable winter snuffs out light, life, growth, 
And though we claim Thaw's kiss will always come to kindle life anew, some roots are chilled too deep and stir no more. You know that I once lost the will to battle. That night I gazed up hopeless from the becalmed shearwater at stars too cruel and far for aspiration. That night I learned Poseidon is intolerable, distance of frost too deep for hope's faint flicker to endure. You knew Poseidon was too strong, my lord Apollo, didn't you? That old enemy distance has stamped out your spark a thousand times and will a thousand more. I boasted, when my own light was relit, that he had never snuffed it out in every breast at once, but he could. You knew he could when you began this war, this quarrel with your uncle. Apollo Epibateriae, Lord of Embarkations, you who lead us on to ships, not for Hermes' journeys from settlement to settlement as coins from purse to purse, but for far journeys beyond borders, knowledge, maps. We living arrows whom you aim at worlds away. You knew your all-encircling uncle can strip the feathers from our shafts, the strong sails from our masts, and leave us grounded. They say you two built Troy together that side by side in ancient days, uncle and nephew laid her firm foundation stones. And I believe it, for Utopia is no sailor without a sea. But while you, my lord, still love your Trojans dearly, the fearsome earth shaker aids the Greeks against us, raging that we did not pay his labors back with thanks and sacrifice. We did not thank you either for your gentler gifts, perhaps, but not for the journey, not for your command that we must face intolerable distance for your sake again, again. That you still love us shows your strangeness more than kindness, distant archer. For it is no kindness when you, who dared not face your mighty uncle when he challenged you on Homer's battlefield, restart that quarrel here. You know he wins. You know your Trojans suffer, but no, all this is stranger, deeper than a quarrel, for the two of you are yet one thing, two parts of providence as interlinked as lungs and heart. You light the spark and snuff it. So what was yesterday? <laughs> that yesterday, when you taught me taught all of us that there is a true intolerable, a limit to what we can endure before all sparks die out, before Poseidon beats us down, before love, yes, my love for you, my lord, my own Anax Apollo, before my love and his love too, a greater love born in a greater breast than humans there both snap and die. That yesterday, when you bade fate and heaven open to reveal that when such love reaches its breaking point, then you, Apollon Prospie, far-seeing Apollo, you, Apollon Prostateria, Apollo before the doorway, you, Apollon Hecate, Apollo who aims so far, and most of all that you, Apollon Theosenie, Apollo guardian of strangers, care. You care. That changes everything. So I begged Caesar. I dared beg a boon of Caesar that he take me from this cell a moment bound however he wills so long as I could see with my own eyes night and her lights uncountable which must burn different after such a day. And he too wise to give a monster such an inch of freedom is yet so kind. He promised he would step out into the night himself, gaze on your t distant targets with his own eyes, Lord Apollo, then return and tell me how the stars have changed.
end of passage. Thank you very much, Eda. That, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, in fact, we have a number of, uh, yeah, there's lots of, <laughs> yeah. we've actually some people here suggested that maybe you could do the whole thing as audiobooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've actually <laughs> been meeting online a little bit with the small group of people who have uh, read it already and reading choice bits aloud because a lot of the sections like that where I worked very hard on the meter really are designed to be spoken like that. Yeah, that's great. It's like uh, classic, well, ancient kind of classical poetry, the way it's kind of, the, the kind of rhythms of it. It's very, very, very effective. So mm -hmm. we come to the point, uh, this is quite nice because we're now having questions and we are at the question and answer bit. Um, so now is the, the time to uh, to put your, your questions to our, our panel. And uh, I'm going to just scroll my chat up here because there were a few at the beginning. I'll just uh, see if we can pick a couple of those out and uh, get us started. Um, I ask a question. Yes, Jane, you can ask a question. <laughs> yes. I have a question, but it's, it's, it's to Rachel. Rachel, um, I think you have in that poem about fairs at least five picture books that you could work on. Um, and it could be about a boy whose father or mother is a taxi driver and comes home and tells these stories and each one is bigger than the next and more galactic than the next. I think it, you should oh, think. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that would be really lovely. That would be so nice. That's one of the lovely things about writing for children, I think, is that you can have pictures. That's I think right. books for grown ups should have pictures. It's absolutely. But it's, right, it's right there, you have it. And if yeah, it's all fine, you. you want to talk to me about it, I would be delighted to talk yeah, to you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, as, as an art director, I have to be completely behind all books should have pictures. <laughs> that's why that's why sure yeah. I have so many illustrations. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, I've got a question here that we've just uh, from earlier on. Uh, we've got Ziv Witties has uh, asked one here. Uh, somebody, uh, she's, I'll just read the question out. It's, it's quite a, a detailed. I'd love to read some genre criticism, theory, and non fiction that's relatively current and recent, less specific reviews of books. I'd like something at least slightly broader than that. I don't entirely know where to look, but I suspect each of you might have some fascinating recommendations. So I think, yeah, sort of uh, genre criticism uh, of the, the old style, I think Kingsley Amos type stuff, presumably, not just on the actual review. Any, any ideas where we can find that that sort of thing nowadays? Joe hasn't finished it yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> She's working on it. It's great. Okay, so watch for that one. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Those. Right. So, uh, any more any more questions from people? Uh, you can you can wave. Um, I'm not sure. If we, maybe I should go to gallery view and I can see people waving. Then that'd be an idea. Uh, if anybody wants to wave a question, we can put you on. There or, are some uh, questions in the chat, Mark. Some sitting down the chat in the bottom here. So let's just have a flip down here. Uh, lots of nice comments as well. Uh, if you look down that. Uh, but as we get down the bottom, yeah, here's some some questions. One from Evan Willis. Does Evan want to ask his question or? Will I read that one out? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Okay, I'll, I'll read that one out. It said, uh, having read the first three Terra Ignota books several times, I managed to talk my book club into reading Too Like the Lightning. They're all really enjoying it. Any suggestions for discuss discussing questions or for our discussion afterwards? I almost want Joe to answer what make good discussing questions rather than be, because uh, I always get distracted by the bigger picture um, though I know a lot of people find it very helpful to talk through um, which aspects of the world feel like dystopia and which ones feel like utopia because it's it's neither right it's in between but it's in dialogue with both and oftentimes in a conversation you'll discover that one aspect of the world feels really comfortable and great to some of the readers and really uncomfortable and depressive to other people who might not have anticipated that the other would have that opposite uh, reaction to the world built. So it's a useful uh, question for it, as well as the, you know, uh, which of these hives remind you of which trends in current you know, evolution of politics and the ever popular, which hive would you be in if you weren't a utopian? Uh, because most science fiction fans are usually utopians. Uh, Joe, do you, you want to add anything? Hmm? Yeah, that's genuine. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I would say uh, if you're um, if you're doing a book club on on those books, if you start with which hive would you be in if you weren't a utopian, at the end of that question, you know what questions you want to ask next, because <laughs> the different answers that you've got from the different people uh, will will lead you in interesting directions that that you can you can take it. Um, yeah. So I wanted to say that one of the problems I have when people ask me about my books is that what I put down and what they read are sometimes different. Um, and they want me to justify my thoughts and tell them how they should read. I think every book is a conversation um, between author and reader. And sometimes we're, we're looking at the same book and sometimes we're reading something else. And, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, at one point I remember somebody sending uh, me a letter asking if they could read one of my stories at their wedding. And I was fine with that, except it, to me, it seemed like the oddest story to read at a wedding. It was, it was about, it was a fairy tale about, um, um, a young, um, about a giant who steals a child who is the son, who brings up the son, and that the, the, um, uh, the villagers go and they have to send a child in to argue with him. And I'm going, a wedding? You know, what does this have to do with a wedding? But it meant something to them. So I said, sure, go ahead. By the way, they were from California. So that maybe it made sense there. Thank you. Um, right, well, that, that's uh, it's interesting to have a question that asks what questions we should ask. Uh, that, that, that kind of, <laughs> nice and open. Very good. A good good idea for a question. Uh, okay, I've got, I've got a general one here uh, for everybody uh, from Juliana Rouge. Do, do you want to ask your question, Juliana, or do you want me to read it out? Uh, you, you need to unmute if you want to ask it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was just wondering how everyone discovered. Uh, Scotland as a literary home, and thank, thank you, Julie. Yeah. Caroline. So, what, what do you think? <laughs> if you'd like to start that one, mine was mine was easy. Mm -hmm. My husband was a professor, and we took. Um, he called me up and he said, uh, "I've just gotten my first um, uh, my first sabbatical, and there are three places that are doing interesting work that I'd like to follow up." I said, "Sure." I mean, a writer can go into it, right? Um, and he said, uh, the first place is in um, Texas. I went, mm, no, I don't, I don't want to spend six months or a year in Texas. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll visit you. Um, the second one, he said, was in Portland, Oregon. And I said, great. Not far from Ursula Le Guin, you know. It, it, but I said, what's the third one? And he said, Edinburgh, Scotland. I said, is this a test? <laughs> and we went to Edinburgh and then from there we went the next time he had a sabbatical to St. Andrews and we fell in love with the house that we were renting and bought the house and 30 years later I have a still have a house in St. Andrews so that's how I got there mm -hmm. yeah. for, for me Scotland isn't a isn't a literary home it's a literary place to visit um, after the Helsinki Worldcon, uh, Ada and I were both invited to the Edinburgh Book Festival, uh, and we participated in the Shoreline of Infinity event in the Edinburgh Book Festival. And then we enjoyed the Fringe so much while mm -hmm. we were in Edinburgh, and yeah. then we went to stay with Jane in St Andrews for a few days. We just had a, the best time in Scotland. And uh, we just thought the next year uh, we should do this again. We should we should uh, go to the the fringe again and and uh, see some more plays. And I got in touch with Noel and Russell and said, you know, we're going to be in town. Would you like to do another event? And they organised the first one of these events. And then last year we were going to be there again, and they just organised it again with the exact same people because the first one was such a blast. It was just just so terrific. Super. <laughs> yeah, I um I 
live in Scotland. I live in Edinburgh. My partner is Scottish and I've lived here since I was 20. Um, it, and it's a wonderful place to be and to write. Um, and as I'm sure Jane will have found it, I think Scotland really values writing and writers. And it's, um, it's a good place to be if you want to to feel kind of surrounded by other writers and creatives doing interesting things and, and to feel that there's a place for that. And, and I love Edinburgh and, and Scotland in, in particular for that. Yeah, and you know, jo Joe and I had the same answer. We, I was invited out for the book festival and it was great. So we came again and again. Great stuff. So yeah, it's nice to know that we were welcoming enough the first time. <laughs> That's great. Good stuff. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, let's see, do we have any more questions here? Uh, yeah, we have one from uh, Scott Milne. Uh, is this Scott want to read his? I'm trying to see if I've got Scott anywhere. Uh, oh, Scott, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, Yeah, sure. Um, so this is for everyone. Um, is there a piece of sci-fi in any media form that you keep coming back to? And why sci-fi? What about the, who the genre has really sort of pulled you? Okay, I'll throw that open. Who'd like to have a go with that one first? Yeah. Okay, um, I, I, I can, I can address that. So I think the thing with science fiction is that it allows you to tell any kind of story, and it allows you to have a crucible in which you can examine the present for the future. So you're, you're part of the literary conversation going back to Homer, but also stretching, stretching forward. Um, and people are always asking me, there is a question I get asked all the time because I've written two books about science fiction history and because I've written among others, people are always asking me, what one book should I read? Uh, whereupon I just want to fold bed and spindle and mutilate that person because there is no one book that everybody should read. What you should do is read lots and lots of books. And if you read lots and lots of science fiction books, even if they're all terrible, even if they are all dreadful books, okay, if you read 20 dreadful science fiction books, you will have a much better preparation for what is coming for the future than if you didn't do that. And if in your 20 random science fiction books you've happened to hit on one good one, then you will have thought about things that then will become issues in the future and uh, it will have opened the world for you. So there isn't one thing that I keep coming back to. There's a million things I keep coming back to in different circumstances and different contexts. I'm always recommending all kinds of different things as things, as things come up. You know, if I were there, I would be giving Joe a big hug. <laughs> trying to escape, but I would be giving her a big hug um, because I think the idea that there is the Holy Grail with the one book is astonishing because you could ask 40 people and they would give you a different answer. Uh, 50 people, they would give you a different answer. And then they would turn to the other person and say, I love that book, but that's not the one. You know, how about this one? We could argue forever, but that's true about any canon of, liter of, of literature. Um, my my feeling, I, I was president of the the um, CIFWA, the science fiction writer, science fiction and fantasy writers of America for two years for my sins. Um, and what I learned from being around that many science fiction and fantasy writers, more or less at the same time, is that there is not only is there not one book that's for everybody, there's not one science fiction or fantasy writer for everyone. Um, some of the people I dislike the most, I like their books. Some of the people who I loved them didn't like their books. That doesn't make any of them wrong books. It makes them different. Uh, we each read differently. Some of us read for knowledge. Some of us read for, for adventure. Some of us read for mystery. Some of us read for comfort um, and on and on and on. Or we may read for all of those things. 
And, and to think that there's one book that's going to do it all, you know, is, I think, um, well, I just think it's not possible. Good question. Rachel or either. Rachel, you got something? Yeah, Scott, I, I think it's a really interesting question because although I agree with Jane and Joe um, that there's no one book that everyone will like, I think finding out which books each individual person likes can tell you a lot about them as a person. And it's really interesting. Um, I'm really into poetry, so I love Edwin Morgan's sci-fi poems, I think, and science poems. And I think that um, there's something I'll come back to again and again throughout my whole life, but also anything about robots, <laughs> poems or prose. It's always going to be for me. Once um, a random guy on Twitter um, decided to tell me that he thought that um, I was alarmingly pro-robot. Um, he thought this was a very bad thing. And I was like, yes, I'm, I'm definitely alarmingly pro-robot. I love robot stuff. Um, so yeah, anything about robots and Edwin Morgan would be my favorites. Very good. Uh, Ada, do you have anything to add to that one? Uh, just that I think one of the ways you can make the question be an interesting one is to reflect on yourself, which things that you love you find yourself going back to and rereading. Because there are some things that you can have really enjoyed and really love or really respect, but that you don't feel yourself drawn back to revisiting in the same way. And there can be other things that you may not actually hold in as high of regard sometimes, but that you find yourself revisiting over and over. And that's an interesting question for learning about yourself more than it is for learning about the work how often you revisit something um, anyway uh, the theme of robots keeps making me think about Naoki Urasawa's Pluto which is uh, actually a manga but unlike most manga much more in dialogue with classic SF than with the rest of the manga world and does really brilliant things with robot rights stuff because it's a modernization of Tezuka's post-World War II using robot rights as an analog for World War II racism issues, but it's been rewritten about the recent war in Afghanistan, and it's really good for those who are into robot rights uh, issues. Oh, the other thing is, oh think, sorry, Jane, yeah, one, one last comment. I think we're getting towards the end of time. Jane, yeah, you dive in. Yeah, I think it's changed over, over the life of our reading. I don't think I'm reading the same things I read as a kid or as an, a, a, an adolescent, or as a young mother, or as, you know, I'm, I'm at 81, I'm reading things that I might not have read back then. Um, also, those things hadn't been written back then. So I think, I think what you read, you find out what you like. I love munchy prose. I have this long battle with, with uh, one of my friends in Minneapolis. Um, who just wants story, 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 story. And it just has to be all about the story. And I say, if I can't get through the prose, it's not gonna be read. Um, if, I, if you cannot convince me in the first 20 pages that I'm gonna love your prose all the way through, I don't care what story you're telling, but that's me, that's me. So, so there are plenty of books out there and you learn as you read one after another after another, what you like. And that's the book for you. That may be the perfect book for you. Well, thank you very much. Reed. Well, we're kind of at the end of our um, allotted slot here, but uh, I think there will be a bit of chance to chat a little bit as we fade out later on. Uh, but I'll need to kind of bring the main uh, proceedings to an end. Uh, so can I just uh, thank uh, Jane Yolen, Joe Walton, Rachel Plummer and Ada Palmer very much for somehow getting back together again for another year. Um, <laughs> in a strange yeah. way, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're we're in the future now. We're doing all this sort of uh, post-apocalyptic. No, stuff. no, 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 no. Next year in Edinburgh. <laughs> yeah, next year we'll go back to that. Yeah, we'll do we'll do something entirely weird and different then as well. Uh, I also like to uh, thank our sponsor, Creative Scotland, who've uh, helped us be able to keep these things going, uh, despite not having venues and uh, all these things. And uh, Show Infinity Magazine uh, and Show Infinity Group for just supporting and making the whole thing go. And thank you, the audience, for turning up and making it a, a proper event. And I'd just like to hand over to uh, Noel Chidwick, our uh, editor-in-chief and um, founding uh, convener and now, now treasurer, actually. I'm actually the convener these days, but uh, of Solar Infinity Group to have a few words before we, before we finish off. OK, thank you very much, Mark. Mostly to say thank you, Mark, for stepping into the breach 
at the very last moment and taking over Russell's task. Uh, Russell, we wish him well. He's lying in, in his sick couch watching this live on YouTube, I gather. Uh, and thank goodness you kept the jokes to a minimum, Mark. That's a relief to all of us regulars at Event Horizon. <laughs> but don't worry, Russell will be back with jokes better than ever, I'm sure. My delivery is too dry. We, we do need well, Russell, yeah. <laughs> so get well soon, Russell. We're all thinking of you. So, uh, yeah, so thanks, Mark. And just to warn you, everybody, we're actually having a sort of mini science fiction event festival of our own, it seems, by chance more than design. We've got, I think, three events coming up this month still after this one. Uh, we've got next Sunday, we've got Kat Ellison doing a, a spot on uh, breaking down the bad writing rules and getting rid of them. And uh, so any writers there in the audience, come along for that on Sunday. Uh, information's on our website. Uh, on the 20th of August, we've got a lit RPG event, which Russell's uh, in charge of. So I'm going along to learn about lit RPG. I know nothing at all about role playing games. So I'm going to come along and learn an awful lot. That's the 20th, 20th of August. Uh, we've got Conversation 2 writers, Neon King and Chimedum um, Awaibu, who will be talking on the 27th of August. But I've just realised I've missed out. Mark, you've got an event on the yeah. 23rd of August. Is that right? Yes, it is. just being August. arranged, so we're just trying to fix the time for that one. Yeah. But uh, I'll be in conversation with my fellow artist, Steve Pickering. Uh, I think we're basically two old guys who illustrate Shoreline. Uh, and we're just going to talk about how we've been in it from the beginning and... Uh, and just generally how we get into the crazy world of painting other people's stories. And mm -hmm. it, it's all going to come live from the planet NAR6 as well. So uh, it'll be a, a first for us to have something broadcast from such a, a far distance through various subspace uh, mechanisms. Yeah, we, we take Zoom where other people don't. We have Zoom and the alternative universes and we also now travel through space. So Zoom and Shaw and Infinity, we go everywhere. Uh, so... So thanks again, everyone, for coming. That's even more important. And if you want to find out more about Shoreland Infinity and what we do, our books and publications and events, it's at www.shorelineinfinity.com. So come along and say hello. And thanks very much to Jane, Joe, Ada and Rachel. It's been brilliant again. And yes, you're welcome next year. If we can all gather together in the flesh, live in Edinburgh, it'd be great to have you back again. So thanks again for coming tonight. And uh, all the best, everybody. Stay safe, and I'll say goodnight. And thanks again to Mark. Cheers. Good night. Good night. Thanks, no. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you. Oh, we've, uh... oh this is still a few sort of progress, so uh, we'll uh, let people go who want to go. <laughs> Hi, Dad. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hello, Jane. It's so good to see you again. I really appreciated visiting you in Scotland. It was a wonderful visit. Great. We've got a family reunion as well as uh, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, but I have a question for Rachel Plummer. Um, I found uh, I found um, a book, but I can't tell whether it's by you or not. Oh, it's yours, okay. The Mystery of the Wizard's Tomb thing. No, Is that you? Me. That's not me. It's some other imposter, Rachel Plummer. It's a changeling. Yeah, it seems like there's too many Rachel Plummers going around. We have to thin them out. It's, it's um, true. I don't think funny. I'd survive it. <laughs> I'd be the one that was lost in the thinning mm -hmm. process. Uh, I, I love that poetry. I thought I would see where I could uh, buy something of yours, but I can't like winnow through the books here. Where where do I look for you besides Shoreline of Affinity? I have a book called Wayne, which is, is a fact of name, Wayne. but it's Wayne. It's um, retellings of Scottish um, folklore. Okay. And I have a book that I don't know if it's even possible to find it anywhere. You might find it, um, which is called The Parlour Guide to Exopolitics, which is a pamphlet um, of very weird poetry that was um, written to go along with a, a clarinet quartet. Um, and it uh, imagines aliens landing in Scotland. And it's kind of very experimental. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's it. The Parlour Guide to Exopolitics. Oh, yes, that's wonderful. I've uh, read oh, that. Oh, thank you, No, It's like... Um, yeah. Am I likely to have to buy that from a UK bookstore? Yeah. 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 I mean, okay. yeah, I think, yes. <laughs> if you can find it anywhere, <laughs> you're in luck. Yeah. But I, I have a copy <laughs> spare if you want. To. I could probably post it somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. So let me know if you can't find it. Um, or okay. contact Noel, 
and he'll yes yes okay so talk yeah, to me Rachel out on offline we can sort you out with somebody to do that's a good idea I think you can also access Blackwell's online at the moment because I know my son who lives in London buys his books from Blackwell's mm-hmm. Uh, if there's anything yeah. that's actually in print there, then that's worth a try. Yeah. Yes, okay. I just got an extremely obscure Italian Renaissance criticism of cooking from Blackwell's. It was very difficult <laughs> to track down. The only shop you go to for that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and can I ask, uh, can I say something to Joe? Sure. No, I so much wanted to say, after you uh, finished your robot poem, I wanted to say, Dianu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I loved it. I loved it. I, did I, I know some, some here friends the used that poem in their Seder. <laughs> did you really?